If you were a member of the job force in the Victorian era, odds are your job wasn't the greatest. And I'm going to make a wild observation here and say none of you watching this video have had any of these jobs. To that I say trust me, if you think your job is bad, try showing up for work every day at one of these 10 messed up Victorian jobs. At number 10 we have the rat catcher. Now exterminators are a thing that exists today, and while I don't think it's the cushiest job, I wouldn't say it's really messed up. But to get to where it is today, there had to be some bumps along the way. And most of those bumps centered around the profession of a rat catcher. No way back in Victorian times, rats were pretty much everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean in your house, at your work, everywhere. And with rats came disease and lack of food, so some poor souls had to be tasked with wrangling up these little rodents. But it took a lot of courage to commit to this gig. I mean a lot of crawling through disgusting places and holding a ton of rat carcasses. And people actually quite respected rat catchers. I mean, I'm sure you'd be happy too, but they wouldn't be going in alone. Most of the time they'd be sending in other animals such as dogs or ferrets to assist them in their nabbing. And here's a fun fact, Queen Victoria had her own personal rat catcher by the name of Jack Black. Not that Jack Black, but just imagine how funny that would be. At number 9 we have Toshers, and we've hit our first gag warning, so just a heads up, it won't be the last one. Just looking at the word Tosher, you can already tell that it doesn't really bring forward the best image, but just in case you thought it couldn't be that bad, a Tosher was quite literally a sewer hunter. No, not someone hunting sewers, someone hunting for valuables inside the sewers. They'd be looking for anything they could make a profit on, whether it's a coin that someone dropped down there, or something as minuscule as a piece of rope. Some Toshers made a living wage sewer diving, but after 1840, the government started seeing how much profit these people were making, and how dangerous it could possibly be, so they made it illegal. Whether they cared more about safety or money is up to your interpretation. But even after it became illegal, people would sewer hunt, and as long as you didn't get washed away by the tide, wander so far that you got lost, or lose your mind from the smell, people would be arms deep in whatever's down there. And I'm going to gag if I continue talking about this, so let's move on. At number eight, we have the Pure Finder. Wow, if you thought Toshers were gag inducing, let me introduce you to the Pure Finder. Now I'm not going to sugarcoat anything. Pure Finders are poop collectors, but they only really wanted one type of poop, dog poop. That's right, bend and pretend wasn't even a thought for the Pure Finders as their sole purpose was picking up after their dog or others dogs and selling it to tanneries. In London in the 1850s, there were reportedly upwards of 300 Pure Finders roaming the streets. And according to the book, London Labor and London Poor by Henry Mayhew, they had a pretty solid, pun intended, agreements with tanners to ship off their collection. And as you're about to find out, tanners didn't really have the most amazing job in the world either. You'll see that they really got their hands dirty. And number seven, we have the tanner. So what is a tanner? Could be me lying on a beach in Florida. But instead, it's something way, way, way more gross. These people were highly skilled, but as you'll see, the stink that would emanate from their job forced them to live on the outskirts of town. So here's how a tanner's job would go. First, they'd acquire some raw animal hide, which is then dunked in a foul-smelling lime solution for around a week before having all the hair and rotting flesh scraped off. Gross. But here's what's next. They get soaked in bait. What's bait? Why did you ask? Well, it's steaming water consisting of water and our previously mentioned dog droppings. This would remove the lime and other stains from the hide, but you can only imagine what it smelled like. Over the next couple of years, it'd be dried and rinsed and dried again until you get the final product, which would be leather. So look at your leather jacket and think of the process that these people would have had to take to make it back in the 1800s. I don't think I'll ever look at a leather jacket the same way again. At number six, we have a leech collector. Sticking with animals, again pun intended, there weren't very many jobs that sucked as much as a leech collector. This job consisted of someone, usually a woman, walking into leech infested waters with their bare legs and getting as many as they could to latch onto them. I mean it's probably easier than using a net if you think about it, but bloodletting was a big part of medicine back then, so collecting as many as you could was a pretty big deal. So even though those who collected leeches were often suffering from extensive blood loss and infections, they kept on going. Day after day, leech after leech. But look, if you did end up ill, there is an easy way to treat whatever is ailing you. And guess what? It involves a leech. At number five, we have the matchstick maker. The idea of a lighter wasn't really a big thing in the Victorian era, and while they definitely existed, the first one was invented in 1823, but wasn't exactly portable. So 18 years before that, the first match was invented, but unfortunately it sucked. And so people kept tinkering around until the first friction activated match came around much later in 1826. But how did they make these in the beginning? Well, they were made with white phosphorus, which if you didn't already know, is extremely toxic. And to make things worse, 
they didn't even have machines to make these matches. No, it was actually mainly done by women and in the worst of conditions. And before you ask, no, they didn't fully understand protective gear, so things often didn't go according to plan. And that's not even mentioning how they would have to eat their lunch at the workstations, meaning they would end up ingesting the white phosphorus. Now the creation of these lights, was actually pretty dark. At number four, we have the funeral mute. If you thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, Victorian London saw something a step up, and they went by the name of funeral mutes. In fact, a famous funeral mute went by the name of Oliver Twist, where it was one of the lousy jobs in that tale. If you were chosen, or had been chosen to participate, mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick. After that, your exciting and wild job would be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased person's home. Once you've gotten in the required silent standing, your job would be then to lead the coffin to the graveyard. Yeah, that's some truly invigorating stuff. At number three, we have the Resurrectionist. While Resurrectionist actually sounds like a high and mighty position that probably involves some magic or dark arts, there's another word for this profession that paints them in a very different light, and that would be a body snatcher. So back then, when there weren't very many cadavers available for those who wanted to perform anatomical research, in order to get a subject to work on, they'd have to turn to additional measures, which is where the resurrectionists come in. They'd go from cemetery to cemetery and dig up bodies for the purpose of getting paid and the scientists doing their research. Things reached a turning point in 1828 when three defendants were charged with conspiracy and unlawfully procuring and receiving a corpse, and another two were charged with possession. A couple of years later, Parliament passed the Anatomy Act of 1832, which gave free license to doctors, teachers of anatomy, and bona fide medical students to dissect donated bodies, which effectively ended the need for body snatchers. But yet, yeah, they persisted for another 10 or so years. Fortunately, the trade slowly faded away. Number two, we have sin eaters. Now look, in the Victorian era, they had a very different view on loss of life than most of us. So I'm not gonna ridicule them too much, but they did have a profession called a sin eater. And objectively, I think that sounds kind of funny. But within certain sects of Christianity, they actually had a fairly important position. Bull eaters would come in and chow down on some bread and wine that would be placed on a recently deceased person, and the belief would be that this person's sins had been digested by the eater along with the food and drink. Now, not every loss of life would warrant a sin eater, however, as they were mainly brought in for those who had unexpectedly passed. But with eating that many souls comes a lot of stigma. Most towns would have only a couple of designated soul eaters, and after you've eaten that many souls, surely they'll add up inside of you. And that's what many people thought, so these people were ostracized. The practice had all but disappeared by the 20th century, Century, but stories of Sin Eaters in the Appalachians years later question how long it lasted. All I know is, yeah, I'm too full to dispel some evil right now. And coming in at number one is the Knocker Upper. Far and away, there is no Victorian job that sounds more like a Victorian job than a Knocker Upper. I mean, it just screams 1800s, but it doesn't scream it knocks. So here's the deal. I understand and completely agree with the fact that alarm clocks suck, especially when, like me, you're not much of a morning person. But now take the alarm clock and assign that job to a real person. That person is your knocker-upper, a person employed to wake up workers at mills and factories on early shifts, going from house to house using a long pole to knock on bedroom windows. In other words, a person employed to become the epitome of all my hatred in this world. So if you had this job, well, you're not alive anymore, but sorry, I hate you. Luckily for knocker-uppers everywhere, people at the time were a lot friendlier than they are now, but I'm sure there had to be some grumpy peeps who would give you a knock-up for waking them up. And that person would be me. I'd be that person. That's our list of 10 messed up Victorian jobs. Make sure to like this vid, and in the comments let us know which of these jobs you'd hate the least if you had a choice. Look, I'd take eating some bread over going sewer fishing any day of the week. But for Bumblebee, I'm Ethan. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.